hello English Lit students. Um, this is PowerPoint lecture on the major characters in The Importance of Being Earnest. There is a separate one already on the minor characters in The Importance of Being Earnest. OK, so we'll start with Jack, Jack Worthing. And as he's listed in the cast list at the beginning of the play, uh, Jack Worthing, JP. OK, uh, we'll start with Jack because he is the protagonist of the play. And I've got some reasons there why you can call him the protagonist. He is the focus for the play's biggest mystery plot, um, i.e. his parentage and his, you know, where he came from. He's also the first person to start some of the plot's intrigues, i.e. Um, he has um, this lady called Cecily. He doesn't want um, Algy to know where he lives in the countryside. So um, one of the ways in which Wilde is mocking the well-made play is by following those sorts of plot traditions, but in a ludicrous farce. <clears throat> Uh, his past and his deceits are revealed through key props, which is also something that happens in the well-made play. Uh, the handbag, most obviously, uh, but his calling card with his fake name, Ernest, on it. The cigarette case. Yeah, there are quite a few of these. And also he gets the play's final lines. So what is Jack Worthing like? Uh, to all outward appearances, he's a conventional and respectable member of society and society with a capital S as well. High society. JP stands for Justice of the Peace, uh, which means he's the magistrate in his local area. Um, and we saw, didn't we, in the Moonstone, how closely class was linked to power and legal power um, in ways that were not really strictly fair uh, in the 19th century. Uh, his income is mentioned. It's a very nice, fine income. That's seven to eight thousand pounds a year. And he has a country estate and he also has a house in Belgravia Square, which is um, a very smart place of London. We learn a lot of that in the interview with Lady Bracknell. But ha -ha, he leads a double life. So this is the, the thing that's going to drive the plot forward. He has two names. Uh, he is Jack in the country and Ernest in the city, and he has invented the character of his brother, Ernest Worthing. Uh, as we soon find out, his lack of a family prevents his marriage. But I think significantly for what Wilde is doing or not doing in this play, it's a fairy tale ending um, at the end of the play. He has an impeccable pedigree. Uh, so the play raises some disturbing questions, but in the end sidesteps them by Jack turning out to be a perfectly fine member of society, which isn't very radical when you think about it. Uh, so there's an image of Jack Worthing as he appeared in the original production in 1894. That is George Alexander, who, if you remember, was the actor manager. Uh, playing Jack Worthing. It's another way we know that's the main part, because that's the part the actor manager took. Um, worth thinking about him in connection to other characters. He is a balance to Algy's tireless frivolity. So in comparison to Algy, he's given the role of being a bit more pompous or a bit more sentimental uh, when Algy is being completely trivial or completely cynical. Um, so he has to connect the extravagances of the plot and the conventions to real society. Uh, he's he's the, you know he's the least um, absurd of some of the very absurd characters in the play. Uh, he's responsible for a rich young girl's education and prospects, and of course her prospects in these days are marriage. He needs to protect her from fortune hunters, which we see he's trying to do in Act One, and. In the manor house, when he goes there, we, we see how Jack is the centre of a small community. Uh, Dr Chasuble, Miss Prism and Cecily and the servants, they sort of all look to him, however silly he is. Um, quite endearingly, in his proposal to Gwendolyn, he becomes hesitant and clumsy, uh, which suggests an emotional life beneath the surface of wit. So the next most important character in the play, the character with the next most lines, is Algy. 
Um, we can describe him as a dramatic foil to Jack, uh, a character who is similar in many ways, but then like a mirror, brings out key differences. That, that's what we mean when we describe a character in a play as a foil. Uh, he, like Jack, has created a fictional character uh, which allows, allows him to live a life of pleasure. In his case, the invalid Bunbury uh, who lives in the countryside. Um, lots of critics would suggest that Algy is Wilde's alter ego. Uh, that is Wilde's stand-in character in the play. Uh, he shares traits with other dandy characters in Wilde's plays. We can call them Wildean. <laughs> um, so he could perhaps, that's perhaps why Wilde gives him some of the funniest lines, often gives him the last line, the last laugh. He has an expensive lifestyle uh, and he takes clothes and food very seriously. But um, as we are reminded throughout the play, he actually personally is in debt. Uh, and very hard up. In Act One, he's cynical about marriage and romance, so we may, in the audience, like Jack, doubt his intentions towards Cecily. He avoids all his duties and he rarely speaks sincerely. But once he meets Cecily in Act Two, he fits the character arc um, common in 19th century texts of a cad that is a, a, a less than well-behaved young man who falls in love and is reformed. And Wilde points to that, doesn't he, when he when Algie says to Cecily she could reform him. Uh, it's, you know, we need to think about characters not just individually, but in relation to one another. So Jack and Algie, um, that's a really important relationship. They're friends. And I think it's important to know they are good friends, even though they spend most of the play bickering. Uh, they bicker over food, they bicker over values, uh, they bicker over marriage. When they're revealed to be brothers in the final scene, it makes sense of the relationship. We look back and we think, yes, that's how they behave. They behaved a lot like brothers. And in fact, Jack behaves a lot like an older brother and Algie like a younger brother. And in that knowledge, Jack's line in Act Two, when he declares the truth about his fake brother Ernest, I never had a brother in my life. And I certainly have not the smallest intention of having one in the future. That's funny because obviously you can't have an intention to have a brother in the future if you don't have one. But then turns out to be ironic because in Act 3, he does end up having a brother. Uh, then the next most important and female character who we meet in Act 1 is the Honourable Gwendolyn Fairfax. So it's, it's worth keeping your eye on these titles. Yep, that's the sign that she's a member of the aristocracy. She has that title honourable because her father is a lord. Um, she could well be described as a new woman. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the new woman, late Victorian uh, development in um, early feminism. Women who wanted to have more education, uh, a bit more public life. Um, and the idea that she's attending lectures through the university extension scheme. It's a throwaway remark in Act 3 by Lady Bracknell about how she's covered Gwendolyn's well, elopement, I suppose, by telling her father that she's gone to a really long lecture uh, at the university extension scheme. Um, but at the time, this would have been a very telling remark and people in Wilde's audience would have picked up on what kind of woman that suggests Gwendolyn was. Um, she's a comic heroine and she does lots of things that are very typical of comic heroines all the way back to Shakespeare's comedies. She defies the expectations of her gender. She is active in the pursuit of her desires. Uh, you know, in Act One, it's quite funny when she you know, keeps encouraging uh, Jack to propose to her. But then in Act Two, even more so, uh, she's taken his address and she has actually travelled down there alone to the house of a gentleman. So, yeah, quite, quite... Um, uh, dramatic and unconventional. She's aristocratic, she's very opinionated, especially in Act One, where she keeps telling Jack what's what. She appears to be aware of her own beauty and status as a desirable marriage partner. You know, she makes it clear to Jack plenty of people have proposed to her. Um, and um, Algie comments on how she flirts with Jack. She's full of ready-made judgments on all aspects of fashionable life. Uh, when she talks about why she wants to marry a man named Ernest. She's got that idea from magazines. 
uh, she keeps telling Cecily what's in fashion and what isn't. She insists on certain conventions, but uh, she's willing to defy her mother when it comes to Jack. Uh, in particular, she's not put off by Jack's lack of heritage and parentage and breeding. Uh, she finds it romantic. So in some respects, Cecily is a comic opposite to Gwendolyn. She's younger, she's unsophisticated, she's country dwelling. Uh, in act one, Jack describes her not a silly romantic girl. She has a capital appetite, goes for long walks and pays no attention to her lessons. But she is an heiress and she is excessively pretty. Uh, and that's what alerts Algy and makes him interested. Uh, but as we've seen in Act 2, quite hilariously, she provokes but deflates Algy's worldly wit with a sort of um, engaging cheerfulness. Uh, that word ingenue, ingenious, uh, is ingenuous, uh, it's the opposite of being cynical. She's, she's completely honest and open, even though <laughs> she has created an entire fictional life. Uh, she treats her fictions as real and true in a, in a very confusing manner for poor Algy. Uh, so just like we looked at Algy and Jack together, it's worth looking at Gwendolyn and Cecily together uh, because they do share similarities. They both take the lead in proposing to the, the, the young men. Uh, they both turn out to be attracted to a name rather than a person. So in Act Two, their um, ideals are exposed as shallow rather than serious. Their holding of an ideal is, is revealed to be a pose. Uh, all it boils down to is they want to marry a man whose name is Ernest. And they're both less romantic than the men wooing them, um, which, which is funny because it's an inversion of the usual um, idea of who is more romantic, a man or a woman. Um, so that, that creates some really funny lines, um, well, particularly when Cecily is so patronising to Algy, that always makes me laugh. Lady Bracknell is our last major character, um, and she's important because she's the antagonist. Okay? Her role in the drama is to stand in the way of Jack's desires um, and needs. So she sets herself firmly against Jack marrying Gwendolyn. Not once, but twice, in Act 1 and in Act 3. Um, linking to her contexts, she can be seen to share the concerns of many mothers in high society. She's preoccupied with appearances. Yeah, how often is she talking about the appearances of things? Uh, women's hair changing colour overnight, how high Cecily holds her chin, things like that. Um, and she's determined to marry her daughter well. So Wilde can be seen to use Lady, Sat Lady Bracknell to satirise the real values and attitudes of her type, um, not just her gender, her class as well. She's materialistic, she's snobbish, she's callous and she's boorish. Yeah, she's not interested in culture or art or anything <laughs> except for money and status. And she has this exaggerated fear of revolution, reform, and the working classes. So she's extremely, a good word for that is reactionary. So she's often making comments about, you know, her fears of the French Revolution. When she hears Bunbury has been exploded, she assumes he's been the victim of a revolutionary outrage. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind that the audience is encouraged to laugh at her, not with her. Uh, she is oblivious to her own hypocrisy and insensitivity. So Wilde is mocking the level of power she and women like her held in Victorian society. So in some respects, that could be seen as slightly anti-feminist. Yeah, um, that, that she's a villain. And therefore, although it's funny that she has uh, symbolically emasculated her husband, the play's logic is that this is wrong. So if things were returned to their correct places, uh, she should not have this kind of power. She should be in the home and her husband should be the one out and about. So although comedy inverts those things, it inverts them in a way that makes you laugh and think, ha ha, isn't that funny? Therefore, that shouldn't be the way things are. Oops, sorry, just missed my. There we go. Uh, now, there is a task here um, that's sort of a revision task. And you could do this for any major character. 
Okay, you could be asked individually or in pairs about any of these major characters. So although the paragraph asks you for Jack, um, you could practice doing that for any of these major characters. Okay, thank you.